He's one of the world's most influential Muslim leaders. His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Mazrur Ahmad is the caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslims, Canada's largest growing Muslim population. With mosques across Canada and millions of followers around the world, he preaches a simple love for all, hatred for none philosophy. He's met with leaders around the globe to promote a more peaceful view of Muslims. This month, he's touring Canada to spread his message. We sat down in Toronto. It's been, as you know, 15 years since 9-11. Many attempts have been made to narrow the gulf between the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world. But at least in North America and in parts of Europe, that doesn't seem to have happened. Why do you think that is? This present situation flared up, not after 9-11, in my view, after 2008 economic crisis. There you see number of people, especially youth, were made redundant from their jobs. They had nothing to do, it was the cause of increasing their frustration. And then a new extremist group emerged, that is Daesh or ISIS. So they also tried to get benefit out of that frustration. Are we at a, a critical point inside the mus Muslim world? Yes. Muslim world is disturbed, and now that is spreading, it is going beyond to the West. When we see these tensions increase, we see people react in different ways. We've witnessed in the United States for the last two years an election campaign for a new president. We're literally only days away from that happening now. Yes. One of the candidates has advocated a total and full ban on all Muslims entering the United States. And occasionally he walks that back to a different position, but to at least extreme vetting of all Muslim. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. What does that say to you? You see, as far as we are concerned, we are true practicing Muslims. We do not believe in any extremism. As far as other Muslims are concerned, he says that he will put, put complete ban on them. Okay, he can put ban on them to stop Muslim groups. But what about those millions of Muslims living in, the, in his country? How will he behave with them? I believe that if, and that if is very big, if he wins, he will not implement it, what he's saying. Is that not just wishful thinking, though? I mean, he, he yes, speaks it, it, for it, it, millions it, it, of yes, Americans who yes, feel that way. Yes, even, even millions of Americans are not backing him in this regard. Right. But millions of others are. Are. And we've reached a, a moment in our in our history so, so, where so, that... So, so, then, then there will be a, you know, see, a chaos in the country. If he takes any measure, any step, any harsh step, or tries to deny the rights of the Muslims living in his country, then there is a conflict. And there's a, when there is a conflict, then again going to be a disturbance. Even with this, there is no big issue nowadays. As such, it has not been implemented. But even then, Every now and then you see Muslims are taking revenge. They are brutally killing without any reason. I mean, even in America, it is not only Muslim. There, you can see there are so many mad people in the country who just enter inside the university or the school and they start firing on the students, innocent people. So in America, it is already happening. And if, and there's no gun law, and if he tried to implement whatever he is saying, then I fear that there's going to be a big civil war. 
civil war. Yes, of course, they will raise against the government because now government, if government takes harsh measures just to try to deny all their rights in any way, there, there are so many hundred, hundreds of people even, you see, to create any disturbance or nonsense, you, if a single man can even can single-handedly do it. So they have to use sense. I don't think a president of America, if ever elected president of America, will take any buyer, which is senseless. You hope. <laughs> this we are allied with His Holiness, a courageous champion of religious freedom and of peace. Ahmadis are renowned throughout the world for the devotion, peace, universal brotherhood, and the will of God. Let's move it to Canada for a moment. Um, I want to read you the results of a, a survey that was done, a Syrian refugee question. Canada's been a, a leader in bringing Syrian refugees to the country. And Canadians have felt pretty good about the fact that they've the brought in. Vote. But the results of the national polling partnership between the CBC, that's my network, and the Angus Reid Institute, 68% of Canadian respondents said minorities should be doing more to fit in with mainstream society instead of keeping their own customs and languages. Now, interestingly, same poll in the States, only 53% of Americans said that. So 68%, almost 7 out of 10 Canadians said minorities aren't doing enough to fit in with the values and culture of the country they've come to. What does that tell you? If, uh, whether it is America or Canada or any of the Western countries, even millions of people are coming to Germany. If they are, those immigrants or refugees are given any status or absorbed in the country, that it is compulsory incumbent upon those people to live in that country which has given them refuge peacefully and try to absorb them in the society. But to my view, as far as religion is concerned, it is quite different from that of law. We Muslims, we Ahmadi Muslims, are very much absorbed in the society. And uh, we believe that uh, even it is the saying of the Prophet of Islam that the, the love of your country is part of your faith. If, and it means once you enter in the country, when you get all the necessary benefits, you get the citizenship of that country, then you have to do your level best with all your capabilities and faculties for the betterment of the country. Let me pick up on, a, uh, on that point a little bit, because you've been critical of some Muslim mosques in Britain, and therefore I, I, I assume you, you think beyond just Britain on this issue. But you've been critical of the fact that in some cases, imams have allowed radical thought and organization to take place in their mosques. So they haven't been strong enough on that issue. You see, if imams are behaving in such a way, I, even I said to the British press and other European press that if they think that imams are playing their role in radicalizing the people, Muslim youth or anybody. If they have or that they have? They if, have. Not all. No, no not those, all. Those, those who are. Mm -hmm. See, even if they are not, even then they should be monitored. What does monitoring mean? Monitoring means if they, when they are delivering sermon, they should be so monitored at every sermon. If they are not publicly saying that one, then at least it is the duty of the, the, the agencies and the government to keep vigilant eye on them. 
So allowing security inside. Security and vigilance that what they are doing. It is not spying. Some it, would see yes, it as spying. Yes, no? it is, somewhat, this is why I use this word, because you cannot put the life of the nation at stake because of just some, some few people. People say that we should integrate. Those who are coming, Muslims should integrate in our Western society. Yes, of course not. It's not a matter of only society. To me, integration is you have to be law-abiding. You have to work for the betterment of your nation and country. This is integration. And never do even think ill of your country in any case. This is, as far as religion is concerned, the government should also give freedom to all the people who practice any religion. A Muslim should be free to hold his uh, or practice his religious uh, teachings. And even if you think that uh, to go to the club or to go to a bar and drink alcohol is, is part of integrity, to me it is not. If you say to shake hands with the women is the part of integrity, to me it is not. Even I once a lady journalist asked me in Sweden that you do not shake hands with ladies. How can you absorb yourself in the society? Hmm? So I said, uh, to me, sh shaking hand is not the only thing or that can help the country or ju just that can justify my being the, the honest to the country. Well, I, I, seeing as you've raised that question, because as you know, it is, it, it is a question that many non-Muslims in North America especially ask about the the relationship between men and women, the way women are seen inside mosques. I, let me show you a picture just from last, last weekend that would seem to some. This was, this was uh, here at one of your Can services. Yes. And there are none hundreds of if not thousands of people in this room. Here, and none of them is a uh, woman. There are no women. Yes, but if you go to the other hall, mm -hmm. thousands of women are sitting there, and even my, I myself delivered direct lectures to them in their hall. But they're in different halls. They are in different hall. This segregation is, you call it segregation, right? Well, you're calling it that. I'm calling it, but this, this right. is the word used by the yes. Western people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm using your word. <laughs> okay. <Right? laughs> so, but to but some people, to, that's to, just not you acceptable. See, like, do, not, do not accept. But those who are happily doing it and they don't, do not have any objection against it, ask them whether they, are, they feel happy and comfortable when they are segregated and they are holding their function as separately. When they are sitting just, they are not being kept there as, as you know, your, your prisoners. They are free, you see, they are organized. But they're not free to go into that room. They are free to hold their functions. So if they accept it, then the person who does not believe in it should not raise any question against. They say, they are comfortable. I always ask them, telling them, they go, okay, we, you just go inside, ask the women, am the women, whether they feel comfortable when they are, uh, in your opinions, in, in so-called segregation, or they are not. But do you really, <laughs> you're their religious, spiritual leader. So, so this is the do you really think they're going to say so this, to you, this, this, this no, 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 I'm not comfortable? Yes. They're going to challenge you and your authority? See, see, there's no compulsion in religion. Okay. There might be some few girls who would say that they could not understand the teaching because they did not, they did not go deeply into the true teaching of their religion. But once they understand the logic, you see, every teaching in Islam has the logic. It is also religious commandment to the men and women. 
in the Holy Quran. First to men, that they should lower their eyes and should not, you see, keep lustful eyes on the women, right? And see, that is the that is the parda or hijab for the men. And then in the next verse, it is said to the women that they should also behave in the same manner. And apart from that, it is the teaching. It's a religious teaching, whether you like it or not. So we cannot say there are so many arguments if you go on debating on this issue. OK. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't don't want to dwell on this, but you, you brought it up, so I, it, it was something that I that I wanted to ask. I assume you accept that that for a lot of non-Muslims in this country, it's a sensitive issue. The relationship between men and women, yes. and how they're seen as equals on on everything. Um, you know, we now have a government where the, the cabinet is 50-50. We have a prime minister who was actually criticized just a few weeks ago for, for being in a men's only mosque uh, event. Um, so it's a sensitive issue. This is what I say. The government should not interfere in the matters which are religious. If being a religious body, religious uh, organization, a sect, we believe and both parties, men and women, believe that this is the part of their faith to do hijab. Hijab is mm -hmm. the barrier. What hijab means is a barrier. So not free mixing, but as far as the opportunities are concerned, our Ahmadi ladies are more educated, more literate than the men. They are doctors. They are working in the hospitals. They are engineers, architects, scientists, research workers, doing all these things and with all with hijab. So these are the opportunities we are giving to them. We are not usurping their rights. We are not depriving them of their uh, yeah, I mean, potentials. Whatever they have, they are teachers. Even in, in Pakistan, in, in a third world country, where it is said that uh, the literacy rate is very low, our Ahmadi Muslim women are more literate than men. You can adjust yourself alongside your religious teachings. The Ahmadiyya community plays a vital role in promoting the positive diversity that is at the heart of Canada's success as a nation. I want to just get your thoughts for a moment about Canada. You visited before, you're spending a significant amount of time here right now. Mm -hmm. You have mosques from Newfoundland to Victoria, British Columbia. When you travel in Canada or when you think of Canada, what are you sensing about this country? You see, as far as the worldly thinking is concerned, Canada is developing. Canadians are always very loving people. As far as with regards to the, our community is concerned, we are also growing here. And uh, even not the old mosques, we are, have started building some new mosques there. And the number is increasing not only because of the immigrants, which those who are coming from Pakistan. Now there's some refugees came from Syria to Canada, they are Ahmadis. Besides that, even some of the Canadians have also accepted the message of Islam. Our work is missionary work. And religious communities do not develop in a short period of time or overnight. It takes years. So we are hopeful we shall spread the message of true Islam to Canada and all across the world. If our message is good, acceptable to the people, they will accept it and we shall grow here as well. And I am hopeful. Do you see Canada as a tolerant nation? Quite right, because multinational 
I'm a multi-ethnic nation, so this is why you have to be tolerant. <laughs> right? Because it's a constant challenge. Yes. Can we do a better job in the world of trying to ease that relationship between the two worlds that we've talked about throughout here, the Muslim world and the non-Muslim world? You Is see, there a role for Canada in that? Yes, you see, Canada has a role in the United Nations. Canada has a role in G8, right? So you should make them realize that we should be honest to the people, to the nations. Every small nation, even quite a number of small nations, have nuclear weapons. So you should play, the government should play their role to let the world understand and give them the sense that they should realize why do we want to leave a legacy behind us of crippled children and destroyed world. You paint a, an awfully bleak picture. It is not bleak, because it is a reality. I remember once I delivered an address in Los Angeles in the reception. One of the senators was present there. He said, I, I agree with so many of your things, but the, the, the picture you are you know, painting is so bleak that I don't, don't think that nuclear war and this and that can ever happen. So just last year, he sent me the message, you were right. <laughs> right. Hmm? I really appreciate the time you've, you've spent Thank with you us. Thank you very much. Thank you.